Well, good morning. My name is Scotty Crawford, if you don't know me. I haven't been up here in a bit. Uh, but it's been great. Aren't y'all glad to hear from better speakers than me? Yeah, Jarvis, thanks. Yeah. Some people are surprised at how little the senior pastor preaches at Brownwood Community Church. And it's just one of those things. If you have at least a couple of other really good preachers, why would you want to hear from me all the time? Because I know y'all get tired of my voice because I get tired of it. Yeah. But anyway, we are in week six, only four to go after this Sunday in this uh, series about fruit of the spirit. So this morning, I'm just going to jump right in with one of those questions I like to ask. And I know uh, most of us, I'm stuck here. My thing's not, there we go. Y'all don't ask questions like this, but I'm a pastor, so I'm paid to ask questions like this, right? When God considers the state of affairs in our world, kind of big picture, what is he most concerned about? And what makes me ask this question sometimes is I, I get in lots of spiritual conversations. I'm sure you're shocked at that. But sometimes religious people, and I just mean that as a general term for, for Christians, they voice their concerns and frustrations with the world. And sometimes I don't always... I'm a nice guy most, most days. I don't always say it out loud, but sometimes I'll walk away thinking what they were concerned about. I wonder if God's concerned about that as much as they are. That's why I ask questions like this, right? Okay, uh, because here's why we should ask that. If, if we can align our concerns with God's, we are truly living out our Christian discipleship. And so think about that for a minute, okay? And now when, when um, sorry, I don't know why this is not working. Maybe the battery went down. I'll put it in my pocket. Thank you, Jordan. When you consider the issues most American Christians, because that's our part of the world is why I pick on America, right? What they're most concerned themselves with today, what, what, just think about it, what are they? Take a moment to think, as you think about kind of the American church, the Christian church, and, what, and how you know this is what people post about, what people talk about, especially what people complain about or want to, you know, debate and argue about. You know the things. Um, we, we all see different things probably a little bit, but there's probably a handful that we could name together and go, people are really up in arms, Christians are really up in arms about these few things. And I would just say, as you, as you keep those in mind and keep that first question in mind, then the next way, the next uh, part of that question is when you consider the state of affairs in our world, what are you most concerned about? What, 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 what keeps you up at night? And maybe you're like, Scotty, I don't care. Okay, great. I wish we could all live that way. We'd probably be better off for it, but we get concerned about stuff, but hold the answer for yourself in mind for just a minute. What, what gets you concerned about the world and the state of affairs in our world? And then think with me, when we're asking the question about what God's most concerned about, can we know? Is there, is there an answer to that question, you know it's a trick question, like you can tell in the tone of my voice, right? Here, here. Interestingly, interestingly, Scripture is really clear on this. I don't know if you do that. Because you've heard so many Christians now, you're probably like me, at sometimes you're confused. Like, wow, I didn't know that was all such a big deal. Until the Christians told me it was a big deal, right? But Scripture is clear. And, and there's many examples throughout Old and New Testament of what God really concerns himself with. One of those examples from the Old Testament, just so you know, I do read the Old Testament at times. He has told you, Micah 6, 8, he has told you, many of you could quote this, oh man, he's told you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? He's saying this is important to God. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness oh, and to walk humbly with your God? Do you ever hear Christians talk about those things as if God's concerned with them? 
Uh, we should probably listen to Micah. <laughs> we have a Micah, right? So how does your list that you had in mind for what you're most concerned with, how does it compare? Does it even get close to these three things that the prophet who's speaking on behalf of God to the people of Judah saying, this is what God really wants to see from you, justice, kindness, and humility. And he's speaking to them and he's correcting them and rebuking them because they're really religious. They're really faithful with their sacrifices and their rituals of purity, trying to be right before God for their own sake and all the things that they were doing, and yet they were oppressing the poor, constantly taking advantage of the poor. They had un dishonest scales to measure things by to take advantage of people. They were land grabbers. They would just take land from the poor people and, and use it for their own discretion. They were just the, the, the rich and the powerful were just taking advantage of the small people, the normal people. And Micah says, God is fed up because God is concerned about that. <laughs> kindness is my assignment today. You're like, Scotty, kindness is not coming from your voice. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's an interesting one to talk about. I found it very difficult to, to do this one, not just because I had four weeks off in a row from preaching, but also it's, it's funny as you start doing all the word studies and, th and thank God Bill did such an incredible job last week, right? And really breaking that one down last week. When you dig into these words, you realize there's so much overlap between the nine. And it all points back to love. Where we started the very first, there's a reason it's the first one in the list. All of them are what love looks like when you live it out in the body of Christ. That's basically what we're talking about in uh, Galatians chapter 5 when Paul lists these parts of the fruit of the Spirit. But yeah, I found it difficult. If you, if you look at New King, or not New King James, but King James translation, which I never use, but every once in a while I, I use the Strong's Concordance, which goes by the King James Version. Kindness is actually translated in the King James Version as, uh, I believe, gentleness. You're like, wait a minute, that one comes later. Yeah, I know. But they all, there are so many similarities, it's hard to divide them up. So we're really just talking 10 weeks about love. <laughs> if that's okay with you. Okay, so Paul, of course, I went back to Paul. I'm sorry. Paul is going, because he addresses the church so specifically and so practically. So Paul is going to spend some time talking to the church at Ephesus about what this should look like and how this should play out in the body of Christ, right? And, and he starts out, like most of this passage, is he's going to spend a lot of time saying what not to do, what it doesn't look like. Sometimes that's the best way to go about it, okay? So here we go in Ephesians. Chapter 4, he says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, he says, Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for what we, excuse me, for we are members one of another. That word falsehood, I want to I take a minute for that because we just think of, you know, direct lies when it comes to falsehood. So I'm going to, I want to apply that in a way that it applies to everybody in the room, Okay. Is that okay? Say, I'm in this with you. I'm so glad. So it's not just lies as what we think of lies. as They're deliberately telling something that's false, okay? We, we also could say falsehood applies to those hasty conclusions we make about people. Arr, dang it, right? Yeah, and, and so many times... We, we do that about people. We, we see someone that appears a certain way or, you know, in my growing up years, like just the last name Crawford was a label because my brothers, <laughs> they were something, right? And, and, and we do that with people. We hear their last name or we know who they're associated with or where they come from. If they come from a place like Stephenville, right? Or in, and where I grew up, Goldthwait, like we don't trust those people. I mean, they're automatically we jump to conclusions and make assumptions. And what we do, here's how we, here's how we justify it for ourselves. Okay, I'm preaching in the mirror today this morning, okay? 
because I know y'all don't do this. It's just me that do this, does this, right? We, we go, my experience tells me that kind of person. Y'all don't do that, do you? Ah, uh, yeah. And what we end up doing is we fill in the gaps of what we don't know with what we think we know about people. Mm. And he's also telling us here, don't do that because we're members one of another. You know, elsewhere Paul talks about the church as a body and that we fit together and we go together. So in Brownwood Community Church, Community is a big word to us. Like, that's not just a cute name we came up with because it sounded cool or it sounded generic or sounded whatever. Community is really important to us here. That's why we hang out. That's why we have funny fun nights. And you'll find us hanging out together outside of church. One of the things Paul's getting at here is when we harm our neighbors, we're harming ourselves. We're harming the body that we're part of. Why would we do that? Those quick judgments we make towards others, maybe they just, maybe they just look bad today. Like, right? Like, I mean, I realize like, that's every day for me. Like, I got to look at the mirror and go, okay, I can't leave the mirror until this looks better. And it takes a while sometimes. Ah, we, when we do, we, we, Paul's saying, no, no, stop that falsehood stuff. You're harming them, but you're also you're, you're, harming, you're harming yourself. Don't say, well, I know people like that. No, you don't. You don't know that one, right? Okay, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Not sorry. Here's the thing. That talking about speaking the truth to your neighbors. Sometimes the only way to speak the truth is to remain silent. Sometimes the only way to speak the truth is to remain silent. Like, that's the best advice you've heard in six months at least. You should write that down and take that with you. When you feel like you want to jump into that conversation because you feel compelled to be a part of the conversation and you really don't know much about it, but you're like, oh, I got to say something. That's important. Ha, 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 right? Just go, I'm going to speak truth by shutting up. I don't know if you knew this. We're not obligated to share our opinion. We're not obligated to have an opinion about everything, are we? About every situation or every person. Ah, we should just sometimes think before we speak and go, I probably shouldn't have an opinion on this. I'm going to be quiet and, and do something as spiritual as listen. Mm. Paul goes on, I'll go on. Be angry, he's got a bunch of them here. Be angry and do not sin. We've all heard that one before, most of us. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. He's saying, yeah, anger is a normal emotion. How many of you felt anger in the last week? If you don't raise your hand, you're lying. Let's go back to part one, the falsehood part. No, okay, anger is normal. Things happen, especially when you're in a group of people, a community, a church, a body. Like if you're within six feet of another person, you're going to be angry at some point because they're going to give you that look or they're going to make that weird sound or they're going to do something that's going to make you angry. Being angry is expected. In fact, when you feel angry, you should let yourself feel that anger. Paul says, as you let yourself feel it, don't go sinning against that person. Hold off. Stay calm and stay silent. And then he says, don't let the, the, the sun go down on your anger. He's not talking about if they made you mad at 9 p.m., don't go to sleep until you've dealt with it. 
That's not what Paul's saying. It's an allegory. He's saying, don't let the sun go down. Think, what would you mean when you said that? Don't let time keep passing on that anger. Don't just let it stew and say, you need to deal with and process that anger somehow, some way. Don't give yourself up to the anger and let it overtake you, causing harm to the other person. Don't sin in that anger, but also don't let the sun go down on it. That next slide, please, Jordan. And, and give no opportunity to the devil. He's, he's still in the context of anger. Because think about this when it, when it comes to anger. You are never more susceptible to evil than when you are angry with someone. Have you noticed? Have you ever just... Look back on that, that moment you just had with your friend or your spouse or your child. Where you look back at it and you're like, wow, something took over me. Something came over me. Yeah, you better, you better know something took over you. Evil took over you because you took what was done for you and tried to return it back to another person. And sometimes the person receiving it from you is not even the person who did it to you. Again, like y'all looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about, but I know you do. Okay, every now and then just humor me and nod at me. <laughs> right? You're never more susceptible to evil than when you're angry at someone because you're vulnerable. And that emotion is so strong and so powerful, it can take over if you... Let it. Now, y'all are going to love this one. Y'all ready for the next one? We're just picking on everything that's the opposite of kindness. Like, y'all know that's what we're doing, right? That's what Paul is doing. Okay, the next one, Paul says this. We'll hear some amens on this. Let the thief no longer steal. Amen, right? But rather, look what he says. But rather let him labor, doing honest work, with his own hands, so that pause. I'll go back, Jordan. Don't let him see it. <laughs> what reason is Paul going to give here? If you were raised the way I was raised, then you're thinking, yeah, you need to get your butt to work so that you can take care of your family and take care of yourself and stop depending on other people, right? That's part of it. But it's not the reason Paul gives. <laughs> Y'all, nod at me if you know what he's going to say next. Some of you know the scripture. Okay, here's what he says. So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. He's saying, quit stealing. Do good, honest work so that you can help the people who are really in need. Amen. See, Paul's not saying we should do away with welfare so that nobody can take from others what, right, what, come on. Like, Paul said, no, there are people legitimately in need and if it's not you and you're stealing and ripping people off, cut it out and get to work so you can help the people who really need help. Amen. Wouldn't that be great? Like, I don't care what your political convic conviction is in that regard. That would just be, make good sense that there are people who need help. And the rest of us, according to what Paul says, who is according to what Jesus says, says we ought to be helping. Oh, okay. Let's do that. Stop being selfish and looking out for yourself. Not get busy, but get to work, be productive, play a part in helping those who really need help. Now, Paul's meddling, but he's not done yet. <laughs> now he's really going to step on our toes. Let no corrupting talk come out on your Instagram or Facebook or TikTok. <laughs> like, we got so many different mouths in our world today now, don't we? Oh my gosh, it's like you shut, <laughs> you're posting with this, and you're still letting corrupt talk come out. Yeah, we're like monsters. We have multiple mouths today. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up. It's a core value. Y'all remember that, build others up, yeah. But only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace 
to those who's here. So he's starting with what not to do and saying, instead of doing that, instead of spending your time talking with corrupt talk and talking bad about people or talking down about people, again, I know y'all don't do this. I'm preaching to the camera, right? Don't do that. Instead, you know, build people up with your words and give grace to those who listen to you. Huh. And then... In this context of what Paul is talking about, we all know this is the best. Like, we all know this. I'm not telling you anything new. Because your mama told you, if you don't have anything nice to say, that's pretty good advice, actually. So say thank you to your mom, because she's actually pretty smart. And then, we tend to think Paul's jumping subjects here, but he's still talking in this same context when we get to the next verse. He says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, we're Trinitarian, unapologetically, at BCC. That means we we believe God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all equally God, same essence, three persons. The Holy Spirit is God. So what Paul is saying Don't grieve God. What's he talking about? What what is it that actually grieves God? If you keep it in its proper context and what Paul is talking about, he's saying God is grieved when we harm each other by our words or actions. Now, I don't know if you, like your perspective and how you view God as a person, If you think of God's emotions, most of us, the only emotion we think God has is anger. Right? Again, that would be a proper place to nod at me like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. We've all gotten a dose of that from fiery preachers generally, right? With a microphone and a platform. God is grieved. You know what grief feels like? Mm. And this kind of grief that Paul's referred to here, don't, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. He's talking about you parents in the room, when you've, when you've watched your children hurt each other, like really hurt each other, like lash out in anger and uh, that. My mom, bless her heart, God rest her soul. She must have lived with that grief constantly because my family, we just hurt each other physically and emotionally constantly my whole life. And, and I think about any time my, my boys, which isn't very often, thank God, were fighting or had, like, as a parent, you're like, I don't know what to do. I can't take a side. I, I'm I'm grieved. And God, when he sees that amongst his children, it's like, it grieves my heart more than anything. When you harm each other, when you do damage to each other on purpose with your words and with your actions. If you're not parent, you've had those two friends before, really good, close friends who meant so much to you, and they hurt each other. They started fighting, and there was this division, and you were grieved because you didn't want to, there's no way to pick sides because they both mean so much to you. You just All you know to do is just go, just hurt and grieve over the hurt that they're doing to each other. That's the kind of grief that God feels when we do harm to each other. And then he continues. He says, let all bitterness, just look at all the different words he uses here. I'll focus on one. Let all bitterness, when you don't deal with your anger and you don't deal with forgiveness and hurt, you just let it stew, that bitterness, that poison that takes over your your attitude and your emotions, not only to that person, but to everybody else. Don't let all bitterness and wrath, that desire to lash out, and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. That word clamor is interesting. So I wasn't real sure specifically what Paul was talking about. And you know what he means? You know what the word means? 
shouting. I mean, unless my Greek tools are wrong, they're not. Shouting at one another. That doesn't happen at your house, does it? They're at your job, they're in your friend group, or like you don't ever experience that, do you? Hmm. The truth is, when you're shouting, you're angry. Now I realize there's exceptions. You're raising your, like you're yelling at your children to get their attention because they're so far away, you've got to yell to get your voice. I, okay, but when you're yelling at a person in a discussion, you're yelling because you're angry. There's no other explanation. I used to make excuses. You know what I used to say? This is how spiritual I was. I'd be like, no, I'm just, I'm not angry. I'm just passionate. This just, this, this topic means a lot to me, so I just get worked up. The truth is, I didn't know how angry I was. <laughs> I had a friend tell me and confront me a little bit lovingly, say, Scotty, dude, you could teach a class on anger management like you've got your anger under control. And I was like, okay, well, that, I think that's good. She said, but you're one angry dude. Why? Over a lifetime of injury and offense, I had let the sun go down over and over and over and over on my anger, swallowing it, compressing it, stuffing it, all of those things we've all learned about. And eventually, it comes out. And usually... For people like me, it would come out in some yelling match where somebody just said the right thing at the right or the wrong time and out it came. Shouting goes hand in hand with anger. So when you're shouting in that conversation or discussion, you know what you're doing? Just like me, you're sinning in your anger. You're sinning in your anger when you do that. So think about that next time you hear yourself raising your voice. Then Paul gets to what to do. And of course, he uses our word for today. It sounds like the message we teach to our elementary school kids, even preschool. It's so elementary, we think, ah, that's just, Scotty, that's just fluff. We don't need to hear that today. We're adults. Uh, yeah. Paul was not writing to children. He was writing to adults who would teach children and instruct children. But he says to these adults in Ephesus, be kind to one another. Be kind to to one another. And then this one, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Here's what I found in my life at this point. I'll be 51 this month. I've been a Christian since I was 16. So yeah, that's 35 years of wholeheartedly following Jesus to the best of my ability. And at times I didn't do this very well. But here's what helped me. We should be constantly aware that we are sinners needing God's kindness. You won't give it to the other person until you've recognized your need for it for yourself and then having received it from God for yourself. That, to me, is the key of be kind, becoming a kind, tender-hearted, humble person. See, there's this idea that growing in maturity as a Jesus follower, as a disciple, as a Christian, there's this idea that, that maturity looks like someone who just gets better at not sinning. And I... That is part of it, right? Like, again, no, please not at me there. Like, so you, I know that you know what I'm not saying. 
You definitely shouldn't sin more. <laughs> okay, that's the alternative, no. But what I've found, especially in just the, the last decade of my life, where you would think in my 40s, having followed Jesus that long, I'd have gotten really good at not sinning. And maybe I did, but what I became more aware of was how badly I sinned all the time and how much sin had taken over me and how much of me was still in need of God's grace and kindness and mercy. And I'm so desperate for God's kindness and mercy and forgiveness for me that I don't have time to try to talk bad or judge someone else because of theirs. But what it does, I'm so in need of God, it's tenderized my heart towards people who do wrong or who've even done me wrong. And now it's more of grief for sin than it is necessarily that anger that I used to always feel towards people. Paul wraps it up. He says, therefore, be imitators of God. Be imitators of God as beloved children. In other words, we have never looked more like our Father than when we show kindness to one another. That's what Paul is talking about. But it's hard. Another place to nod, right? It's hard. It's hard to be kind. It's hard to be nice. It's hard to do good for someone who's done bad to you. It's hard to do good and show kindness to someone who's betrayed you, who's hurt you, who's lied about you. All of those things, like we've all experienced to different degrees, but we've all experienced it. It's hard. Because we've grown weary. You, you can probably think of a person, you've grown weary, you're like, you don't want to show kindness to that person anymore, so you just avoid them altogether. It's just easier that way. Ah, I'm a two Enneagram. I'm a helper by nature. I want to help people all the time. Like my, 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 my true motivation most of the time is to help people. And I got to a point, there was, there was, there was a, a situation that occurred where I try to help people all the time and, and, and that help got turned on me and turned into this vile attack towards me and, 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 it, and it crushed me because all I wanted to do was help and it put me in a place I'd never been before where I was literally going, I don't want to do ministry anymore. I don't want to pastor anymore. I don't want to talk to anybody anymore. I just want to remove myself from any situation where I feel like I need to help them because I don't think it's worth it anymore. There's this phrase I got familiar with called compassion fatigue. It does apply to people in ministry, but it mostly replies to people in healthcare. Like, you know, people in healthcare who work through healthcare it, it, through, the, through the pandemic. And there's the constant giving and helping and nurturing and, and trying to make things better for people. And it's just a losing cause. And you begin to ask the question, what I do doesn't matter. It's just a drop in the bucket. I can't, I'm trying to help, but it doesn't seem like it's doing any good. Have y'all ever been there? When you get there, it makes you want to go, I'm just not going to try. Why bother? When it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. What we need when it comes to showing kindness in that helpful thing because the word kindness in Old and New Testament, it implies action towards the person. Not just feelings and emotions, but you actually do something for them. You do something helpful to someone who needs that help. We need a different perspective about what it means to be kind. Along with better boundaries 
and understanding as humans we are limited in what we can do. And just a little commercial, just so you know, that's actually what we train you to do in the Emotionally Healthy Discipleship class. It's all of those things. So you should join us next fall when we do it again. But what we have is this what I call a savior complex. In other words, we believe we have to save the world. A lot of Christians are driven by this belief that we, the church, have to save the world. There was a famous preacher who kind of fell from grace, but he used to say, the hope of the world is the church. And there was something in me that went, I don't know. I mean, I get what he's saying because God doesn't have a plan B other than working through the church. But let me tell you, folks, you already know this. The church is not the savior of the world. There's only one savior. His name is Jesus. That's why our mission statement is what? Introduce people to Jesus because he's their savior. He's the only one who can save them. The church is an important part of God's plan of salvation for the world, but we are not the savior of the world. Here's what we do. We show kindness to show the world who God is. Did you know the world doesn't know God? Did you know that the world does not know God? And if they say they do, they don't. They've got a wrong perception of God. Many of them have a wrong perception of God because we've given a wrong perception of God. We can't save the world, only God can do that, but we can show kindness to the world around us, to the people around us, so that we can show them who God really is. Out of the kindness we've received from him, we can give it and show it to them. Our hope for the world is that they would turn to God. That they would turn to God. Now, that's where the church is a part of the hope of the world, yeah, because God has chosen us. He's already demonstrated it through Jesus, and now he expects us to follow Jesus and show that kindness to the world around us. Kindness ought to be part of the way the world describes the church. Here's what N.T. Wright says in his commentary to this passage of Scripture. He says, kindness and mutual forgiveness are the very essence of Christian community. Do you think that this is the way the world would describe even the church in our area, the Christian church in our area, even just Brown County and the surrounding areas? Would the world describe the church, generally speaking, in that way? I would say no. No, because I do tend to have questions with unchurched people on occasion. And that's not how they describe the church as they know it and as they've experienced it. But we here at BCC, we can help change that. We can help change that. One person at a time, one interaction at a time, we can be a part of making a difference the way the world sees the church. Because the way the world sees the church, unfortunately, is the way they see God. So when God, back to our question, when God considers the state of affairs in our world, what is he most concerned about? Well, how we treat one another. How we treat one another. And parents, again, isn't that how you feel? About your children? If you've got more than one? How they treat one another. Let's agree together to look for an opportunity to change that perception as we get an opportunity to show kindness to anyone we come into contact with, especially that person, when you see them, your tendency is going, oh, I want to go the other way. 
We don't know how they'll react to you, but determine. I'm going to give myself over to God, surrender to Him, and show kindness through my words and actions. And I think if we'll agree to do that, just that, oh man, I don't know. We might get half of the 16,000 unchurched in Brownwood if we do that. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I know this is a hard message. It was hard for me, and it's hard to hear. But the grace that we can receive from you, God, we are so grateful for that, that even when we get it wrong and we harm our neighbor and we do something hurtful, that even then as you look at us, you might be grieved, but you still look on us with mercy, grace, and forgiveness. So help us. Help us surrender our hearts in such a way that your kindness flows through us to everyone around us. Thank you for your grace at work in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. I appreciate it. I'll be back in about three weeks. So you're going to get better preaching for the next two weeks. And I hope if, 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 if these messages are starting to be heavy for you and hard for you, some of that's okay, but don't get to a place of guilt. I want you to go back to part one. Not because it was me preaching, but because we started off by talking about how this works. It's not just by you trying to be kind. It's about giving yourself to the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit can produce his fruit in you. God bless you. Y'all have a great week. We'll see you next time.